Not only is vibe coding getting more and more popular, but people are starting to radically expand the boundaries of what vibe coding even means, moving to vibe code their entire business work stream. Welcome back to the AI Daily Brief. Today, we are once again talking about vibe coding, one of the most important phenomena of 2025, certainly an early contender for AI term of the year 2025. And we're going to talk about a bunch of different aspects of vibe coding today, including what some people are using it for, which is getting way more diverse. But we're going to start with a new study from the information that was trying to dig into not only what tools were people using, but also how effective they were finding them. Now, this is not some big, comprehensive, professional study. It is the information subscriber survey. Given that, it's going to be a highly enfranchised tech-oriented audience. So that is, of course, going to color some of these answers. I would not expect the numbers to be the same if you asked a general panel of American adults, for example. Still, the core question of the study, which is very simple but also a really important one, is are you satisfied with your vibe coding experience? Now, this matters because a lot of the discourse around vibe coding is naturally about its limitations. It's quite obviously powerful to have AI that can code, but we're also trying to figure out how that's going to interact with other types of human expertise, what sort of systems you have to build around vibe coding to actually get things to production. Startups are trying to figure out what gaps in the user experience there are. And so the simple question I actually think is very valuable. And the short answer is that people are having a great experience with this. 10% said that they weren't so satisfied, and 2% said that they weren't satisfied at all. But 53% said that they were somewhat satisfied, and 35% said that they were extremely satisfied. Now, even in a heavy tech cohort, that means that in total, 88% of those who were vibe coding said that they were satisfied with the results, at least somewhat. That's remarkable. What's more, a huge preponderance of the respondents were vibe coding. 75% of subscribers were using these tools. Now, again, yes, this is a tech audience. But still, 75% penetration of a thing that didn't exist at the beginning of the year, at least not really, is enormous. What's more, if the fact that this is a tech audience maybe makes the 75% penetration number a little bit less impressive, one could argue that it makes the 88% satisfaction number more impressive. In the sense that if you gave an average person who didn't really interact with technology very much, or at least didn't interact with it professionally, these tools they're going to seem at first glance much more impressive than it would to people who have much more experience with coding specifically in technology in general. So the fact that you have this incredibly high satisfaction rate is really telling and very bullish for these tools. It also suggests, I think, not surprisingly, that we are in the midst of a permanent shift in how code is written. These are not the numbers that you get around a passing fad. And so with that in mind, I think it's interesting to ask, what are people actually vibe coding? You might remember back at the beginning, there were a couple of high-profile games from people like Peter Levels that got folks really excited. But what are some of the other use cases out there? I think a great way to understand how a technology is evolving is to see how the use cases are evolving. Now, I've talked about how our team at Super is already soft banned from making feature requests. Instead, everyone has to vibe code prototypes, think through the details, and use the actual output to communicate what they're thinking about more fully. But that use case has been firmly established for months, and it doesn't really take advantage of model improvements. What I mean is that it doesn't matter if a prototype is buggy, it's just throwaway code that's meant to communicate an idea. And indeed, what we're seeing now is absolutely a move from that sort of prototyping use case to actually using production applications that are both public-facing, but also just internal-facing and meant to help you improve your work. John Park Hill, the director of machine learning at Terre Therapeutics, showed off a custom-built front-end for his data. To give you a sense if you are not watching, it looks like a catalog of different drug molecules and a widget for checking how they react. Hill wrote, The craziest thing about vibe coding is that you now sometimes make a UI just to make sure your underlying data abstractions are working right. Presently, I'm writing a fully expressive logical enumeration engine I need to make an ML dataset. So useful. Now again, just to double click on this point, this is the type of thing that a year ago, if John had coding skills, he would have had to spend a serious amount of time away from his main work doing, or go hire a team of freelance developers for a couple of thousand bucks. And after a bunch of back and forth, he might have had something functional after a week or two. Now something like this can be done in a couple of afternoons. And what's important about this particular example, I think, is that it demonstrates that a whole new world of custom software is opening up. 
there are likely no more than a couple of hundred or maybe at most a couple of thousand people that would need this sort of application spun up, meaning there's just not the incentive there for it to become commercial software. But now it could exist for very little money and basically on demand. Joe Butler, a staff member at OpenAI, shared another example. You remember that week off that OpenAI gave to try to get their people all chilled out a little bit? Well, Joe writes, OpenAI gave me a week off, so naturally, I vibe-coded and shipped a new app. The tweet thread continues, Here's how I accidentally built a production-grade app from scratch in less than 10 days, using almost entirely new tools and some AI magic. Now, he went on to describe a simple tool that enhances photos for Airbnb hosts, a pain point he was experiencing at the time. Now, this came out of a real experience. Joe writes, Updating my Airbnb listing photos made me realize a painful truth. My photography skills are terrible. Could AI make them look pro? Turns out, yes, but it needed careful prompting to avoid that fake AI look. Challenge accepted. Now, by way of background, Joe writes that the last production app he built was back in 2018, and the stack back then was, in his words, a janky combo of Angular front-end and PHP back-end. This time around, Joe's stack included the GPT Image 1 API, V0 by Vercel for design, Windsurf, and OpenAI's Codex tool. The net of it was this. 10 days, 60 PR merges later, I had a fully functional app built entirely with tech I'd never touched before. Who knew vibe coding wasn't just a meme? By the way, if you want to check it out, go to turtledit.com, T-U-R-T-L-E-D-I-T.com. I think what Joe's story shows is how much vibe coding unlocks entrepreneurial creativity. This is a highly speculative product that started with a solution that someone needed for themselves. And not only would the economics of building it for yourself probably not have made sense, Certainly, if you were thinking about doing something public, the risk is that you have to put down thousands of dollars to hire a dev team or take that time yourself to build an MVP before you know if you have demand. Now you can just push the code. Now, one of the common critiques of vibe coding has been that it's only for that use case that I mentioned before of prototyping. But Marty Markinson points out that prototyping goes a lot farther when it comes to trying out new ideas. Marty writes, vibe coding isn't for the final product. It's for validating products in days, not months. Instead of wasting time building production software that never gets used, you can have an idea, build it in hours, and share with friends for feedback. If it takes off, you're going to need to build again from scratch. But increasingly, I'm not sure even that's true. And I certainly don't know that I think it's going to be true for long. Lenny Rachitsky of Lenny's Podcast and Lenny's Newsletter, who I'm sure many of you follow, just about a week ago posted, On LinkedIn, X, and in my newsletter Slack, I asked you, What's a product or tool you vibe coded that you actually use regularly in your work and life? The response was overwhelming. I got over 1,000 enthusiastic replies, ranging from a buzzer app that automatically answers apartment deliveries, to a hyper-personalized greeting card generator, to a workplace accomplishments tracker, to a daily newsletter that can help you learn a new language. Now, Lenny shared 50 of his favorite examples, and frankly, these don't feel to me like just throwaway random apps. Morgan Brown built a carb counter, saying, I built CarbScan to help manage my son's diabetes and blood glucose levels with faster carb counting. I used Replit. Has become a daily go-to. Vajit Quadros made an app that was simply about how many layers should I wear today. Makes me think that he has to be in San Francisco because that's a question that you really do have to ask every single day. What's interesting about this one is that clearly other people want it as well. He said, I vibe-coded this with Lovable and use it myself every single day. It's grown to 85,000 users in total. Now, of course, you could say, couldn't you just use a weather app for this? Vajith's argument was that they had too much clutter when this is all he really cared about when it came to the weather. There were tons of these sort of personal designed for me types of micro apps. Sue used Bolt to build an app called Flowbound that gives them exercises or games to do when they find themselves procrastinating on something. It helps them monitor whether they are overwhelmed, confused, hopeless, anxious, distracted, disorganized, etc. There was also a pickleball games tracker, a nicotine pouch tracker, tons of parenting and family apps. There's this one very cool one that creates stories by dragging emojis into a pot. It's called Story Pot, and you literally take a bunch of emojis, put them into a little image of a pot, and it cooks up a story based on that. And these really run the gamut from small personal apps to things that people have pushed into full production. Ben Ogren built a chores app for their kids called Chores AI that's now available in the App Store. And of course, there is a ton of work productivity meeting prep automation using a Zapier agent, a Chrome extension for sharing availability, a personal time trapping app to help with productivity, an inbox focus tool, and a whole bunch more. And the point is that vibe coding is really running the gamut 
from simple, highly personalized, very specific tools that you only think are going to be useful for you to full production apps. In other words, it's not only expanding who gets to participate in mainstream and economically beneficial app creation, it's also radically expanding the surface area of custom personal software as well. And it feels very much like we are still just getting started with how far you can go with Vibe Coding. A week and a half ago, Greg Eisenberg tweeted, wait, you can actually run your entire business from Cursor using AI agents? I had no idea. This Cursor expert never leaves his Cursor app and gets everything done faster to make more money. So this is a semi-anonymous user known as Amir MXT. His startup is called Humbleytics and does internet marketing data. Amir wanted to know how far he could scale his company using AI, so he set himself the goal of doing everything without leaving the cursor window. Now, rather than creating apps for every element of his business, Amir still used common SaaS products for things like accounting and marketing. The shift was that he harnessed MCP connectors to pull data from these SaaS platforms as needed essentially using Cursor as a general purpose agent across every element of his business software stack. Amir figured out that you can just ask Cursor to pull accounting data to generate a quote, then tell the agent to update your backend once it's finished. Eisenberg commented, What you're talking about is how do you make SaaS programmable? This might look cute, but it's really about saving a lot of time, being more accurate, and being more productive. Amir walked through the same kind of workflow for marketing, sales, and customer service. Now, of course, technically this isn't vibe coding an app, but is clearly related to the same trend. What Amir did was leverage Cursor's agentic capabilities and the rapidly growing range of MCP connectors to make custom automations on the fly. What's more, it's not just this guy Amir. Sean Swix over at Layton Space wrote, By the way, by far the most interesting new pattern we're seeing in Layton Space is that people are using Claude Code and Klein for non-coding tasks, and this is becoming surprisingly effective for things like sales, BI automation, and G Suite i.e. read my email, slacks, linear, search web, make report, etc., etc. Of course, enabled by MCP, but somehow both ChatGPT and Claude Desktop have not captured this kind of organic integration and white-collar work automation behavior. This has turned into something of a thread where Swix is tracking this. He points to a tutorial from McKay Wrigley on how to use Claude code for notes and research, and another from Tarek, who's technical staff at Anthropic, who wrote, Claude code is all you need. When I first joined Anthropic, I was surprised to learn that lots of the team used Claude Code as a general agent, not just for code. I've since become a convert. I use Claude Code to help with almost all the work I do now. Here's how. And then he goes on to explain it. He says, in Claude Code, everything is a file and it knows how to use your computer like you do. Name your files well and Claude Code will be able to search them like you would. This lets you make custom setups for memory, to-dos, journals, screenshots, and more. He then goes through and talks about journals and to-dos, Apple Notes and iMessage, MCPs, and even gives a bunch of resources to set up your system in a similar way. So really what we have is an explosion of code at the center of everything. Yes, we are seeing more applications being built, more custom software being built for personal use. We're also starting to see a blurring of the lines between software, agentic automation, and features. For example, when Amir is using Cursor to access his accounting software, it's pretty unclear which bucket that falls into. And that seems like we're actually starting to explore what it means to do AI-first computing. Because the AI and agents can code, it's allowing for people to customize their experience around just being able to tell the agent and communicate to the agent what they want to achieve and accomplish. And while we're not all the way there yet, you're absolutely starting to see the embers of what a completely different computing experience looks like. I can't stress this enough. If you are not vibe coding yet, stop listening to me. Get onto one of these platforms, let it rip, and see what you can create. For now, though, that's going to do it for today's AI Daily Brief. Until next time, peace.